Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week I have this wonderful privilege that The Journey Home is all about helping uh, you understand the journeys of men and women who were drawn by the Holy Spirit, sometimes touching their hearts, sometimes through the, uh, the, the logic of theology and apologetics, but whatever it was, that somehow the Holy Spirit awakened them to the beauty of the Catholic faith. Many of these guests, uh, if you've watched the program before, have come home because they were brought up in the church and then left. And then by God's grace, they uh, sometimes with their tail between their legs came home and uh, in repentance and, and were glad to be back. Some, uh, like our guest tonight and myself, uh, the last thing we ever wanted was the Catholic Church, but we wanted Jesus and all of him. And that meant in time recognizing the beauty of the church. And so I want to remind, though, some of you may not realize this, but this program has been on for 12 years. We've got a lot of conversion stories on tape at EWTN.com. All the old Journey Home programs are there uh, to listen to. If you'd like uh, a copy of the DVDs of the old programs, you can go to the Religious Catalog at EWTN and get all the old stories that have been uh, shared with you over the years here on The Journey Home. But our guest tonight is Dr. David Anders, he's a former Presbyterian. Uh, you, those of you that watch the Mass here at EWTN may recognize him because he sings in the choir once in a while. So, Dr. Anders, welcome to The Journey Home. Thank you very home. much. Thank you. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. I've seen you in uh, Mass singing in the choir. Uh, are you there every day at Mass? Or? Uh, no, we sing just twice a week, Tuesdays all right. and Fridays. All right, all right. So the audience will keep their eyes out to right. see you there right. in Mass. Of course, you visited here, but probably weren't ever sure that you'd actually be up here on, on the hot seat with me on the program. No, I didn't know if that would happen. <laughs> but it's good to have you here. Good to be here, thank you. It's actually good to hear your story because you and I share a little bit of background in our Calvinism, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear. You come from a little more conservative a sliver of Presbyterianism uh, than I was a part of, though we shared our same views. But normally on the program, I invite the guests to begin by taking a step back and give us a summary of your early spiritual background. Sure, you thank you very much. Uh, I grew up here in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, like you said, in a very conservative Presbyterian church, uh, an evangelical Presbyterian church. Um, and I draw that distinction because uh, I came to learn later after I went to seminary and graduate school that uh, evangelical Protestants in America today uh, differ quite significantly mm -hmm. from their forefathers in the 16th century in the Reformation. And uh, our church was very interested in seeing people be born again, have conversion experiences, pray to invite Jesus to come live in your heart. And that was really the beginning of the spiritual walk. Even though we practiced infant baptism, for us, uh, you became a Christian when you invited Jesus to come live in your heart, whether that was at age five or age 20 or, or whenever. And uh, so very conversionistic, uh, very emotional. Um, you were brought up in that in this particular the theological tradition from the time you could remember. I was so growing up at that time, were you aware that that particular slant on Calvinist Presbyterian was a bit different than the Presbyterian churches on the other side of the street? Or? Oh, at that time, no. At that okay. time, I had, I had no understanding, and this was, this was what I was told the Bible taught. This is what the early Christians allegedly believed, and uh, we were just the, the pure Christianity, pristine Christianity. And um, so I grew up in, in this tradition, went to Bible camps, Sunday school, Christian schools, um, invited Jesus into my heart when I was five or six years old and, uh, and stayed in that for most of my youth. Uh, strayed a little from the faith in high school. Um, and then when I got to college, went to, uh, started out at a secular university, um, need, discovered I need to come back to church, re rekindle my prayer life, get back in touch with Jesus. And uh, had, had that been spurred on by the, the uh, parallel evangelical groups on campus? Had that been a part of it for you? No, it was really just a realization that uh, that I had I, I believed in God, I believed in Christ, I believed in the Scriptures. Uh, I had let my prayer life slip for a few years. I needed to come back to the Lord and and rekindle that relationship that I had that I had let go that had been part of my childhood. Um, and so that's when I, I came back into the practice of the faith in college. Um, I uh, met a lovely young lady when I was in college. 
She eventually became my fiance, and fortunately today she's my wife. <laughs> and uh, she started going to church with me. And, and we uh, were at a secular university at the time, and we mutually realized that this university was not conducive to the practice of the Christian faith, and it would be a good idea to seek out a new place to go to school. And uh, we elected to go to Wheaton College, which oh, is sure. an evangelical Christian school in, in Illinois. And, uh, and just to, again, to point out to the audience, not everyone listening realizes that to an evangelical, Wheaton is a household word. That's right. I mean, it That's is, right. I almost hate to use the word Mecca, but I mean, it is the, the uh, touchstone of evangelical America in terms of college level. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that was a major consideration. Yeah. And uh, went to Wheaton College, uh, transferred there in my sophomore year, and began to study theology from really, as you pointed out, the, the finest yeah. Protestant teachers of the faith, the very pious, devout, they love Christ, very, very intelligent, very well educated people, knew the Protestant tradition, knew the Bible very well, began to study the faith intensely with these men and women. And ironically, this is really the beginning <laughs> of my journey to the Catholic Church. <laughs> and as you said, it was the last thing I ever thought I would ever do because one of the corollaries of this Protestant upbringing was that the Catholic Church was the Antichrist. I mean, it was. Yeah. It, it really was the Church of Satan. We considered well, it. In your particular, and you know, I hope that any of the audience that's watched the Journey Home program over the years realizes that just to say, what do Presbyterians believe? Well, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, there's a complete gambit from the most liberal Christian viewpoints to the most conservative, all within Presbyterianism. You that's were right. of that sliver of extremely conservative Southern Presbyterianism that not only did you assume the Catholic Church was wrong, but you probably heard it from the pulpit, right? Uh, oh, yes. Well, mo honestly, more from the missionaries, the teachers in the schools, uh, the, the whole culture of the church was very, very anti-Catholic. Mm. Um, I don't remember that many sermons from the pulpit specifically attacking the Catholic Church, but you didn't need to because yeah. we, we would always have people come into the church. A lot of ex-Catholics would come to the church and you would always ask them, oh, well, were you raised a Christian? Oh, no, I wasn't a Christian. I was a Catholic. You know, but then I came into the Presbyterian Church and saw the light. So that was the whole culture of the church, yeah. that you weren't a real Christian if you were a Catholic. And so I, I, that was the last thing in the world I anticipated. Um, so I began to study the faith in depth, and I really fell in love with the study of theology in, in sacred scripture, and uh, finished school, got married, um, spent one year in the working world, and uh, decided with my wife's consent that I really wanted to go to seminary. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to commit my, my life to the study of theology. And truthfully, one of my major goals was to combat the Catholic Church. And I considered it my, my duty as an evangelical Protestant theologian to show that the Reformation was, was correct, was on sound footing, and that the Catholic Church was in error. That was my objective. And you would have believed then that if you would have converted a Catholic to the Protestant faith, to the evangelical faith, that you were doing them a great service. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in fact, converting a Catholic to the faith was, was almost the highest form of spirituality I could practice. And I can remember being in a, in a class when I was preparing for my graduate school, a GRE prep class. Yeah. There was a Catholic girl in the class with me and I found out she was Catholic and I pounced, you know. <laughs> And uh, one of my great regrets is I, I think I persuaded her at yeah. that time of my point of view. And I, I pray to God that that, that, didn't, that didn't keep, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. didn't take. But, um, oh yes, we definitely wanted to, wanted to go after the Catholics. And uh, so I went to seminary. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which is another one of those flagship evangelical institutions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you come from the evangelical world, there'd be a lot of theologians and biblical scholars whose names you would know who would be associated with that institution. And uh, I studied my Greek, studied scripture, learned the Bible very well, um, uh, and began the study of church history uh, in depth and ended up majoring in church history. And my plan all along had been not, not pastoral ministry, but to go into teaching earned my PhD and I thought one day I would be a seminary professor or a college teacher and that I would be teaching church history 
And my main objective in teaching church history was to justify the Reformation. So I left, I left Trinity with that mindset and, and still very, very anti-Catholic, very anti-Catholic. Um, can I ask a question certainly. there about the history? Because when I went to seminary, Protestant seminary, and studied church history, we jokingly say that, that we pretty much jumped from the apostles to Martin Luther <coughs> and then learned it from there. Uh, you majored in history. Did, right. did you get a bit more than that, than uh, the usual? Did you actually read some of the t fathers? Did you read Augustine? And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. W one of the things that is part and parcel of Protestant identity is the notion that the early church was sound and that it's, we're not, never told exactly what we mean by the early church. Okay, We don't know when early church falls away, but at some point the church allegedly falls away from the purity of the gospel only to be recovered by Martin Luther in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part and parcel of the, of the storyline. Now, when you get to seminary and you begin to study and you really press and say, okay, well, who were these early Christians? All right, the, the only answer that you're ever given, they love the church father, Augustine of Hippo. They love Augustine because Augustine has a very high doctrine of grace. Mm -hmm. He loves the Bible um, and, and they think they find some commonalities in Augustine. So. Our study of the fathers in seminary really majored on, on a few themes when we could find areas of commonality, and particularly in Augustine in his battle with the Pelagian heretics over the issues of grace and justification and salvation. They would gravitate towards those issues and they would always interpret them with a very Protestant slant. So that, that's really my exposure at this stage of my education to the fathers. Because um, I think I remember using a textbook from one of the professors at Trinity. Um, I could guess his name, but maybe I shouldn't use it here, but it was a book on historical theology mm -hmm. in which he took themes, the Lord's Supper or salvation, and looked at it historically. But it was, when I look back, it was proof texting. It was proof texting. That's picking right. from Augustine or maybe whatever father that, that a, a text from their writings that was in line with the way we presently view, or at least see the trajectory of it. That's right, that's right, uh, definitely so. So, um, but I, I did very well in graduate school and, uh, and felt very confident about my future in theology and, and uh, I left and went to the University of Iowa that has a, an outstanding department of religion and uh, began my PhD studies in historical theology. They would call it history of religious thought, okay. you know, but it was yeah. essentially historical theology. And I elected to focus on, once again, the Reformation, hmm. and particularly the, the thought and the writings of John Calvin. I grew up a Presbyterian, and Calvin was our man. And we liked Luther fine, but Calvin was the one who'd really gotten it right, and at least as we saw it. So I thought, this, there's no better preparation for my future career than to immerse myself in the writings of Calvin and all the, all the while to continue my scripture study uh, as I have occasion to study the fathers, particularly Augustine. I need to learn Luther very well uh, uh, and uh, I think I should probably dip my toe into some medieval Catholic theologians, St. Thomas of Aquinas, uh, Duns Scotus, mm -hmm. um, and then some American theologians that were important evangelicals like Jonathan Edwards. So mm -hmm. I really wanted to prepare my pedigree to be the perfect Protestant theology professor, learn all the, all the sources of the Protestant faith. Um, and I was rudely awakened during that process. Um, I, I studied everything that I was supposed to study, and the first hint that something wasn't right was when I really began to dive into Augustine of Hippo. He's a Catholic doctor of the church, uh, but he is, the, he is the one church father to whom the Protestants point above all as mm -hmm. this is the one guy who believed like we do. And I read thousands and thousands of pages of Augustine and I took comprehensive exams in Augustine and I learned Augustine and I came to the shocking discovery that lo and behold, Augustine was a Catholic. And when I looked at his views of salvation and justification, uh, they were Catholic. I, I put them side to side with the Council of Trent. They were Catholic. I put them side to side with the writings of Thomas Aquinas. They were Catholic. And, and I realized that the, that the unique Protestant accents that Luther put on justification and salvation, particularly faith alone, were utterly absent 
in the mind of St. Augustine, mm -hmm. utterly absent. And, and in fact, his, his views were anathematized, rejected mm -hmm. by the reformers, not by name, they didn't reject Augustine, right. but his views. So this bothered me, and I began to look deeper into, well, if it's not Augustine, maybe there's somebody earlier. Maybe, the, maybe Augustine lost it, but someone else had it correct. See, I was, I was wondering, because uh, uh, the assumption behind so many Protestant faiths is that the early church was all right, That's but right. at some point in time it got, it, 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 w it encountered a fork in the road and took the wrong fork, all right? And some push it all the way to Leo the Great, who, which would have been after Augustine. Right, right. So you could push, well, Augustine had some good things, but he had all that burden on his back. And so w were you thinking that? Were you looking for, is there, was there an earlier time or a later time? I can time? remember specifically the, the day I figured out that Augustine was a Catholic and that he really, really did not hold to Luther's views. I, rushing in and finding a Lutheran friend of mine and saying, where do I go now? What, what father should I read? You know, where do I, and he didn't have an answer. Hmm. But I, you know, I began to look and uh, went back to the third century, the second century, and, and it was even more terrifying because the earlier I went, the less like Protestants they looked. <laughs> and, and, and the doctrine of the, of the second century church was even farther removed from Luther. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to re-examine the writings of St. Paul. So I'm gonna go back to my Greek text. I'm gonna go back to the Bible. I'm gonna look at Scripture itself and see, can I, can I find Luther in the writings of St. Paul? And, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the authorities. I'm going to get all the helps I can. I'm going to look at the Greek text, but I'm going to look at Protestant biblical scholars. I'm not going to look at any Catholics. I really want to convince myself of the truth of the Lutheran position on Scripture. So I, I go find Protestant biblical scholars. And I happen across this, this movement called the New Perspectives on Paul which is a movement in Protestant uh, biblical scholarship that attempts to interpret Paul in light of his Jewish context in the first century. And, when I, and these are the first class biblical scholars, all of them Protestants, all of them with Protestant view of the Bible as the sole rule of faith. And I come to find out that the best in Protestant scholarship in the 20th century rejects Luther. And they're not entirely, they're not Catholics. Their point of view on Paul is not entirely Catholic, but they, they provided me with a framework for seeing that Paul, not, Paul also could not really truthfully and honestly be read from a Lutheran point of view. Luther misunderstood Paul. And so from, from the sources of the faith, from the fathers of the church, and from the best in Protestant scholarship, I eventually came to the position that justification by faith alone was a 16th century invention by a Saxon monk who had left the church and was no part of historic Christianity. Uh, and yet, I still didn't consider becoming Catholic, <laughs> but my faith was shaken. Can, can I ask uh, where your wife was in all this? Um, she was taking care of our kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was years, this, was, this process went on for years and sure. years, so it was a long time before she began to see that I was having some theological difficulties. Um, the next, the next big challenge to my faith is, I sort of put that one on the back burner. I said, mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll figure out justification later, okay? I was gonna but say, because that, that could be a career killer. It, it could very well be a career killer. And so I actually spent a few, a few years, how, how, can I, how can I work a, a nuanced version of this doctrine into my theology so that I can continue to be a Presbyterian and, and be employed at a Presbyterian <laughs> institution? You know? um, so I began to study the writings of the reformers and uh, Calvin especially, and Luther, And I have another rude awakening, and that is that the reformers themselves don't believe the doctrines that I was taught growing up. That there is a difference between evangelical American Christianity in the 20th century, 21st century, and the religion of 16th century Protestantism. And specifically, let's, let's go to the, the doctrine of being born again, inviting Jesus into your heart. You have to be born again. Um, this is absent. This is completely absent from the writings of Calvin or Luther. Both of them assumed that Christian life begins with baptism. Now their understanding of baptism wasn't entirely Catholic. They had some things right, they had some things wrong, but they all agreed Christian life begins at baptism. And uh, you can read all of Calvin and you will not find one exhortation to a Christian audience that anyone in there should be born again. The assumption is they are, they are. Okay, and uh, 
I looked at the doctrine of sola scriptura, which, you know, I always thought that meant, okay, I need to read the Bible and find out if these doctrines that I'm being taught are true. That's what I had done with justification. And I come to find out that this is not how sola scriptura, the Bible alone, was applied in the 16th century. In fact, Calvin specifically had a very high view of his own divine authority to interpret the Bible. <laughs> and in fact, uh, strongly opposed the laity in his own church, challenging his authority to interpret scripture mm -hmm. or coming to different interpretations. Yeah. And there was a, a very celebrated controversy in his lifetime with a, with a fellow by the name of Bulsick over the doctrine of predestination. And he was arguing with Calvin about predestination. But for me, the most interesting thing about that conflict wasn't predestination, it was the assumption about who has the right to interpret scripture. And when you read Calvin's responses, that's what really upset him. It was that a layman would dare to challenge his right to interpret the Bible hmm. with authority. And I began to see, okay, this, this, this notion of church authority and, and sola scriptura, the way we live that in 20th century America is different from the way they lived it in the Reformation. Hmm. So. I was gonna say the two things there that also, uh, even the fine tune, which I, I just, which get me as I understand my own Presbyterian background, was number one, this born again issue. Well, I mean, Calvin's view of predestination and not knowing who the elect were and the different, the different uh, shades of the way Presbyterians have understood that double predestination for some. Uh, I mean, they're all quite a bit different than being born again. Born again, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right. You know, well, Calvin's view is, is, for some of them, some of the different Calvinist views, were that that's, some people would know that your whole life whether you're of the elect or not these different views of that. And the other one you, you, uh, you just mentioned, uh, the whole issue of, um, uh, what was the second issue you just mentioned a second ago? We, we, the, their interpretation of scripture. Yes, oh, the, I mean the, the two volume institutes. When you read Calvin's institutes and his strong, almost arrogant at times saying, this is the way it's, it's understood as he writes out his institutes in interpretation right. of scripture. The, to differ with that, you're in trouble. There, you there are a number of places in Calvin, you don't, you don't hear these in the Presbyterian Church today, but when I got into the sources where he, he claims to be a prophet, he claims to speak with divine authority, he, he, he believes very strongly in the necessity of ordination, for, but except in his own case, because he sees himself as having been specially elected by God for this role. He's been raised up like an apostle. This is the kind of language he uses with himself, okay. Um, there was another issue that I found very disturbing uh, in comparing my own evangelical upbringing to the reformers, and that had to do with ecclesiology beyond the, just the issue of authority, things like the sacraments, the Eucharist, um, and uh, are these essential parts of the Christian faith or are they non-essentials? Can we dispense with them? And growing up, our view was if someone was born again, they believed in salvation by faith alone, uh, they believed in the Bible as the sole rule of faith, then, then they were in. Mm. And if they disagreed on baptism or the Lord's Supper or church government, uh, these were non-essential issues and you could just let them pass. That was a really key element of evangelical faith. And we actually prided ourselves on not building up walls between Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists. We're all just brothers in the Lord. When I went back to the 16th century, I discovered that that was not at all the view of the reformers. Uh, Calvin actually says in one little treatise he writes in the 1540s that a proper understanding of the Eucharist is necessary for salvation. Mm. All right. And as you know, Luther uh, wanted to go to war over the issue of the Eucharist rather than join with the Zwinglians, mm. which is a reformed theologian, and the Swiss over what he held to be a heretical doctrine of the Eucharist. He thought the reformed church, the Calvinists, were worse than the Catholics. All right. Mm. So these issues to the Protestants were they were life or death issues. And once again, I woke up and realized, are they life or death issues? I've always thought that these are variable and they don't matter and they're inessential. But here, my own forefathers are telling me that the nature of the Eucharist, baptism, church authority, all of these are issues that are worth dying for and worth killing for, hmm. all right? Um, do I need to re-examine these issues? Now, I'm getting very worried at this point. I'm getting very worried at this point. Um, there was another piece of the puzzle. Uh, in my dissertation work, I did a lot of study on the history of spirituality and devotion. And I studied the early church again. Mm 
And I discovered another fact that was very disturbing to me, um, and that was the prevalence of the veneration of saints and relics mm. in the ancient church. And you know, I'd always sort of conceive of these things as a medieval invention, uh, really a, a, a deformation of the faith, something that the medieval church brought in. Uh, no biblical basis for it as far as I could see. Certainly couldn't have been any basis in the early church for this. And the light really went off in my head when I was reading a study of the veneration of relics by the uh, late antique historian Peter Brown. And he made a statement something like this, that, the, that you can track the expansion of Christianity in the ancient world um, by tracking the growth in the veneration of relics, that the two were coterminous, that you couldn't separate one from the other. And I began to look into it and I found out that this is true. This is true. Everywhere you go, and, e and all the fathers, Augustine, Jerome, it doesn't matter who you look at, um, the, the, the veneration of saints, the place of relics in the life of the church, indistinguishable. Hmm. Well, I had always viewed this as, as really almost nauseating you know, to Protestant sensibilities. <laughs> and I found out I wasn't the only one. There was someone else in the ancient world who also found them nauseating, that was the pagans. And see, as evangelicals, we've been taught these were, if anything, these were something that the, the, We'd that, from. The, that the medieval Catholics had brought over from the pagan world. Sure. And I found out that Julian the Apostate, the pagan emperor who'd wanted to reimpose paganism, the thing that really disgusted him about Christianity was the fact that Christians were the fellows that carried around dead bones. Because in paganism, they had always separated the, the cemetery and the dead from the life of the city. Uh, the city was supposed to be under the protection of the gods, and the gods found dead bones very unappealing. All right? And you were going to offend the gods if you brought them into a place of worship. Christians were the opposite. All right? And that, that shook me, and I thought, okay, I've, I've really got to examine what is the basis for this? Is there, is there any rationale for this fascination with the dead? Uh, my my theological, theological presuppositions had no place for it, but I thought, what is the reason? What's the rationale? And as I began to study the question, I realized if I could be open-minded about it, there was really a profound reason from a biblical point of view, um, from a Christian point of view, even in, from a devotional point of view of devotion to Christ. And it was this, that Scripture teaches and the tradition teaches that the church is the mystical body of Jesus. And in a real sense, when I touch a Christian, I am touching Christ. And even as the sick would touch the body of Jesus and be healed, when I touch Christ in his members, I'm coming into contact with Christ. And when I thought about it, I realized there is a biblical basis for this. First of all, in the Old Testament, in the passage in 2 Kings, where the dead body is thrown into the tomb of Elisha the prophet, he strikes the dead body of Elisha and comes back to life. So we have biblical attestation of the idea of a relic having miraculous powers in, yeah. endued in it. And then in the New Testament, of course, Peter, who, you know, handkerchiefs are touched to mm -hmm. Peter and people are healed and, you know, come back to life and so on and so forth. And I see the same thing happening in the life in the writings of the fathers. Augustine has a story in the Confessions about discovering the relics of some saints, local saints in Milan and the blind to go and touch the caskets and receive their sight. And, uh, but when I saw it in light of this doctrine of the mystical body of Christ and realized the Catholic veneration of saints is, it's not about taking our eyes off of Christ. It's not about, uh, Protestants talk about we believe in Christ alone and you Catholics import all this other stuff. No, no, no. The Catholic faith is so intensely Christocentric that we find Christ in everything, yeah. especially in his body, the church. Hmm. And suddenly it went from being a disgusting notion to one that had a tremendous beauty to me and was, it became attractive. Um, I also realized that the Protestant point of view on the dead is that death wins. Death wins. Death creates a curtain, a barrier, a door between the church on earth and the church in heaven. And the, the, the church in heaven turns its back on us, doesn't care about us, doesn't know about us, uh, certainly doesn't pray for us and has no contact with us. Um, but the Catholic point of view was that, no, no, one of the reasons we venerate relics, this is a foretaste of the resurrection of the dead. We're witnessing to our faith that these bones shall again live. Mm 
because they have been joined to Christ. They've been placed in union with Christ. And from the Catholic point of view, because of our relationship to the saints, we, we rejoice in death because we know we've just gone from better to best and they haven't turned their backs on us. They continue to love us, to pray for us, to be in communion with us. And once you have been on the inside of this experience, you know it doesn't turn you away from Jesus. It, it enlivens your faith in Christ so tremendously. Like Paul when he said, whether you should die or not, he doesn't know which is better. He wants to be with Christ, he wants to serve Christ. And That's he, right. he was torn between this. Let's take a break for Certainly. a second, David, and we'll come back to a little bit more of his story as we hear more about uh, how the Lord was drawing him to the Catholic Church to see a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Dr. David Anders. And before we get, continue with the, uh, the story, I want to uh, remind you that uh, EWTN allows me to be on uh, their network a couple other times besides the repeats of The Journey Home program. I also have uh, the privilege of being on EWTN radio Wednesdays at two o'clock. This coming Wednesday at February 10th, I host Deep in Scripture. Our guest this Wednesday will be Rhonda Shervin. She'll join us to talk about a verse she never saw, a particular scripture that inspired her on her journey home to the Catholic Church. That's deep in scripture this Wednesday, February 10th on EWTN Radio, 2 Eastern Time. All right, David, I cut you off. No problem. Right in the Thank middle you. of your journey. Let's pick up where you're working. I have I've come to a point in my story, in my, in my life's journey, where growing up I believed that we were saved by faith alone, that the Bible was the sole rule of faith, that I had to be born again, um, that uh, as long as I had those down, everything else didn't matter, it was all inessential, and that the early church was on the right track and the Catholics had lost it, all right? By the time I'm coming to the conclusion of graduate school, I've lost justification by faith alone. I've, I've seriously been shaken on my understanding of whether or not all these inessential things really are essential. Do I need to start worrying about what the church is and what the Eucharist is and what baptism means, things that had been unimportant to me before. I've realized that this whole born again spirituality is not original to my own founders. And that's, I don't find it in Calvin, I don't find it in Luther. I really don't find it until the 18th century when the Protestant revivals happened in New England and Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and Wesley and these sorts of characters. So I, I realize my own faith is a relative newcomer in the Christian world. It's about 150, 200 years old. It's not in the 16th century. It's certainly not in the Middle Ages, and I can't find it anywhere in the ancient church. So then I realized there was one more big issue I had to tackle, the Bible, the Bible alone. That was the, almost the final straw. I'd always been taught, always assumed, any theological question I had, I had to go to the Bible to answer it. The Bible was the final authority. All these other questions made me ask, is that true? Is that true? Sola Scriptura, what's the basis? So I went back to the sources. I started with Calvin and Luther. I went back and read them again, even though I knew them quite well at this point. <laughs> what did they say about the Bible? And I realized that for all intents and purposes, the Reformers had no defense for Sola Scriptura. They merely asserted it. They had a few arguments here and there, but they basically were things like, well, we should listen to the voice of God and not men. I mean, truisms, truisms that don't amount to real argument, that prove nothing. Or Jesus condemned tradition when he assaulted the Pharisees and the rabbis. Um, but, but no sustained argumentation in favor of, okay, we know from a divine authority that the Bible alone is the rule of faith. Nothing like that really in the reformers. Um, so I have to move on. So I move into 17th century Protestantism, the, the Protestant scholastic 
theologians. Um, and I began to find more argumentation about the Bible. And then, of course, today in the 20th century, 21st century, you do find evangelical theologians who realize they finally have to tackle this subject and deal with how do we really know the Bible is the rule of faith. Very big, ironic discovery. They appeal to tradition. <laughs> to justify the notion that the Bible is the sole rule of faith, they appeal to tradition. They go, they find some church father who gets in a theological debate and appeals to scripture. Or they look, even believe it or not, at the medieval theologians. Or they point to Luther and Calvin. Uh, or they point to their own experience. But their, their main argument in favor of the Bible is an appeal to tradition. Now, some of them nuance it by saying, yes, but this is not Catholic tradition. We're talking about some other tradition. It's not, it's not the authority of the Pope. It's, but, but at the end of the day, they're appealing to tradition. Um, some of them have actually recognized the inherent contradiction. And there's one Presbyterian theologian who has actually said, uh, we, we don't have an infallible canon of scripture. We have a fallible list of infallible books, right. which has always struck me, I'm sorry, is absurd. Yeah. All right. And I realize that if you, if you stick with the notion of the Bible alone, you, you, there's no basis for it in history, yeah. no. There's, As a historian, were you aware, had you dealt with how the Bible came about, the collection, the canon, had you dealt with that? In you scenario? know, I studied it at great length, I studied yeah. it at great length. And, and also, you're, you're, you're thrown back on the texts of Scripture themselves and the words of Christ himself, and you have to go back and re-examine. You know, we were always, always taught, well, Jesus rejected tradition. Tradition, human tradition is terrible. Jesus rejected it. Therefore, we should reject tradition in favor of Scripture. Jesus always appeals to Scripture. This is the kind of argument we were told. So I go back and I look at the way Jesus, in fact, uses Scripture. And it's true. Jesus quotes the Old Testament frequently. Does Jesus quote the Old Testament as the final authority? and the sole rule of faith? By no means, by no means. He points to his own authority, his own authority as the author of Scripture and the infallible interpreter of the Old Testament. And on the surface, at times, seems to dispense with things in the Old Testament that had a time and a place that are no longer relevant, the dietary laws, of course, especially, uh, circumcision, these sorts of things. Now, there's nothing in the Old Testament itself that justifies that. It's only the authority of Christ that justifies that. Now, what does he do with that authority? Well, he says to the apostles, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go forth to all nations and teach everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you, a promise of divine assistance, until the end of the age. Mm -hmm. So that authority that Christ had to interpret the scriptures, to change the legislation of scripture, to appeal to his own authority, you heard that it was written, but I say, he now passes on to the apostles. Now, is there anywhere in the words of Christ, anywhere in the words of Christ that he mentions the New Testament? Nowhere, of course not. Jesus never mentions the book of Romans, the book of Galatians. While he does refer to individual Old Testament prophets, he never refers to a canon of scripture. So where does this notion come from of a canon? And of course, if you study the history, you know um, in the early church, yes, the, the early Christians revered the writings of the apostles. They passed them around. They shared them with one another. They found out that they had different lists. They didn't all have the same books. So what do they do? Uh, they appeal to the authority of the living magisterium of the church. Pope Damasus I, he solicits the help of St. Jerome, Augustine calls a council in North Africa, and the church fathers examine the question and determine what is and what is not the canon. And so the Bible that the Protestants appeal to, that they say is the sole rule of faith, is a product of magisterial authority given to the church by Jesus Christ. Jesus never says the Bible is the rule of faith. He gives us the teaching church as the rule of faith which would force that particular Presbyterian scholar to say, therefore, it must be a fallible collection because it was put together by the magisterium of the church at the time. Right, a, right. A fallible collection of infallible books. That, that, that's where, that's that, his only conclusion. That's right. So which means, if you take that point of view, if you believe that the Bible is a fallible collection of infallible books, and this, 
Luther would never use that language, but in effect that's what he held because he was willing to throw out books that had been held as canonical before them. Mm -hmm. If you take that point of view, you have to conclude that we have no certainty in our rule of faith. Because how do I know in the final analysis that Romans is part of the canon or that Galatians is part of the canon? Well, what if I don't like Galatians? Can I throw it out like Luther? You know, Luther didn't like James. Uh, Luther didn't like the Deuterocanonical texts. Can I throw out Galatians if I don't like it? Uh, there were early heretics like Marcion who did just that. They didn't like certain books of the Bible. They threw them out. Okay, can I do that also? Well, it opens the, also to that whole Da Vinci Code thing that, that there were other ones that should be in. Precisely. Sure. Yeah. How do you know? What about the letter to Laodicea? <laughs> should it be in there? Can we <laughs> should go digging it up and finding it? Um, so, can, can I have the same certainty, objective certainty, about what is the Christian faith that the apostles had? Can I have the same certainty that the early church had? They, they, they knew what the Christian faith was. They knew with certainty that Christ taught with the divine authority a message from God of how to know Him and be in relationship with Him. Can I know what that is? Can I know what Jesus said? What He taught? Well, only if He gives me the criteria. Only if Christ says, here is how you know what I said. Here is how you know what I teach. And He doesn't give us the canon of Scripture. He gives us the teaching church. So, there goes sola scriptura for me. Okay. Um, and, and I have to, at this point, can I, all right, I really have to start considering Catholicism. All right. Uh, is there anything else I need to put together in this picture? Well, the Bishop of Rome. What about the Bishop of Rome? Okay. And here's what I learned from history. Unanimity, total agreement in the early church that Rome is the see of Peter. You don't find that disputed. No one, even, even the most anti-papal heretic, no one disputes that Rome is the See of Peter. Um, no one disputes that Rome is the, the, the first see, that it is the first of all the primacies in the ancient church, of all the apostolic sees. Rome is the final court of appeal in theological disputation. Um, you find that very, very early on, popes are making claims not only to a primacy of honor, but to a primacy of jurisdiction, mm -hmm. meaning they claim the right to, in fact, intervene in the internal affairs of other dioceses. Mm -hmm. And uh, they claim this as a right emanating from their appointment by Christ as successors of Peter. All these things are on record in the early church, okay? And then I look at, well, what about the problem of bad popes? What about the problem of bad popes? Can I, can I live with the fact that they were bad popes? Well, what is the pope's job description? In the final analysis, it is to keep the faith united, to guarantee the integrity of the faith. Has he fulfilled that job description? And the answer is yes. When I, when I look at the sources of the faith, when I study the scriptures, when I see the message of salvation that Christ taught, that the fathers taught, where is that instantiated in the Christian world today it's in the Catholic Church. It's in the Catholic Church. And moreover, the Church continues to provide me with a living magisterium that doesn't just guarantee the deposit of faith once for all delivered to the saints, but interprets it for me in light of new circumstances, stem cell research, yeah. you know, modern questions that couldn't have been anticipated by the Fathers. I have a living magisterium speaking with divine authority to interpret that deposit of faith for me. So there's not only a historical basis, there's a practical basis. And I begin to see the beauty of that. And it doesn't, well, I grieve that, you know, there have been bishops and popes that have made personal mistakes and sins and so forth and so on. They've, they've maintained their job description. Hmm. All right. They really have. So and by the Holy Spirit, protecting the Holy them Spirit. from not teaching a false doctrine. I mean, the, the Holy Spirit so guarded them that even though their lives were something you didn't. It's like kind of like Jesus said, you know, you to the men, to the uh, leaders sitting on the seat of the cathedral. Exactly. Do what they say. Exactly. Not what they do. You know, they're exactly. That's been part of the. Um, so, at this point, almost all the pieces it, are in place. Almost all the pieces are in place, and the the final intellectual piece in place for me was the realization that Christ had said, 
the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I realized that if, that if Luther was right, if Calvin was right, if the Protestants were right, then Christ was a liar. That, that the gates of hell had prevailed because I'd studied the tradition all the way back to the sources, every century, all the fathers, and there was nothing remotely resembling evangelical Protestantism for 1800 years. And if that was the true faith, then, then Christ was a liar. But I look at the Old Testament. You know, the prophets speak about a, a mountain that will fill the whole earth, a kingdom from sea to sea, all the nations streaming to Jerusalem, you know, light to the Gentiles. It's the most glorious vision of the kingdom of God that would come in the Messiah. And Jesus preaches, the kingdom is here, this long-awaited divine reality that, that God had been preparing for for the in, all of human history and the entire created universe. And it can't last for 25 years? It falls apart as soon as the last apostle dies? This isn't consistent with the view of the, the, the glorious kingdom of God that, had been, was, that is the whole theme of Scripture. And I realized if, if Luther's right, if Calvin is right, then, then Christianity can't be true. But if Christianity is true and Christ is Lord, then the Catholic Church is the church he founded. He founded one church, he gave us one rule of faith, and it's in the Catholic faith. Um, believe it or not, this realization at first depressed me <laughs> because I, I realized that everything that I had ever thought or been taught or held dear mm. or prayed through or studied or trusted mm. was wrong. And, and it depressed me. Mm. And I went through a, a period of, of, of real struggle and difficulty before I actually entered the church. Mm. And this is where the, the spiritual, I mean, all this intellectual stuff led up to, now the spiritual and the emotional begin to play a role. And, and the Lord slowly showed me how it wasn't just satisfying my intellect, but if I would enter the church, there were deficits in my person, my spiritual life, my moral life, that could not have been healed in Protestantism mm -hmm. that would be healed in the Catholic Church. And I'll give you an example. Luther, I believe, was bipolar. This is my personal opinion from studying him. If you've read Luther, you know he was always going from extreme to extreme. Depression, elation, depression, elation, God and the devil, you know. Yeah. And he imported that into his theology. He, he actually talked about, he called it his onfectum. You know, this is a part of the Christian life for him. And he identified that depression with his experience of law and condemnation and his elation with his belief in justification by faith. And he taught that this should be a part of the life of every Christian, that you should move from despair to elation. All right. And I have found that this is in fact the way Protestants operate because of their peculiar doctrine of salvation. They think, if I only have faith, I know I'll be saved. And then they're elated. But then comes the inevitable question, how do I know if I have real faith? Well, the way they define faith is partially experiential. There's a, there's a warming of the heart. There's an emotional, I love Christ. There's this drawing. There's a subjective component to what constitutes real faith. Well, that can always be called into question. And so I have dear family members that, that struggle sometimes. Have I had a real faith? Have I had a real conversion? So they'll, they have, oh, I have faith. I know I'm saved. Oh, but do I know I have real faith? So they're not worried about works, but they yeah. still have this, this yeah. doubt and this question. But then the works do play in because the Protestant faith teaches, if you're really saved, well, your life will show it. Hmm. But then they also tell you, all of your works are hateful to God. No work that you can do merits anything. So you'll have works, but works are hateful. But you have faith, but did you have real faith? And so there's this constant back and forth between these two poles. And I found in the Catholic Church a glorious, brilliant, refreshing objectivity. Hmm. There's no doubt about what the faith is, and there's no doubt about whether I believe it, because faith is an assent to what the church teaches to be revealed by God. Mm. You either assent or you don't, and you don't have to worry about feelings. Yeah. Yeah. And the question of forgiveness, you know, Protestants always teach, when you're growing up, Catholics are the ones that are supposed to be neurotic, and the confessional is supposed to be the worst place on the planet. This is what we're taught. You know, this is why Luther was so messed up, because he'd been to all those confessions. When I went to my first confession, 
it was like a shower from heaven. It was the most glorious experience of my entire life. When I heard those words of absolution, when the priest said, I absolve you from your sins, and I knew that Christ had said to him through the apostles, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. He didn't attach any qualifications. He didn't say, you know, only if you have this emotional experience, yeah. only whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. And if you say, I'm sorry, and you mean it, they're gone. And when I, believing that, because I believe the words of Christ, that first confession, I thought, this is the most wonderful institution mm -hmm. that I have ever seen in my entire life. So far from creating any kind of neuroticism, it relieved so much internal tension, so much anxiety that I had always grown up with. And it was liberating. That objectivity is really key, because I think even converts sometimes don't catch that always, that it's unique. I, I've got a young son who, is learning remorse, and, and but there are times he'll say, "Dad, I'm sorry." And then later he say, "Well, Dad, I didn't really, I didn't feel sorry." But I'm trying to help him. No, no, you, you, it's a choice you make to be sorry. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So the Catholic doctrine of contrition has nothing to do with emotion or feeling. It has to do with a determination that I have done something objectively wrong, and I am deciding to not do it again. Now, you know, tomorrow I may stumble. But my determination to improve my life and to turn away from sin, that's what we call contrition. It's not an emotional thing. And it's very objective, and there's no doubt about it. You know, it's very liberating. So once you discovered all this, were you ready to come in? I mean, you've been through the down, you said. At first it was a downer because you realized... Uh, it, it was a downer. Yeah. It was a downer. Um, the, uh, the, the, the St. Thomas helped me. St. <laughs> Thomas helped me. And, and by the way, before I came on the show today, a friend of mine uh, lent me a relic of St. Thomas. <laughs> so I was able to bless myself with a relic of St. Thomas before I came here. Um, Calvin had always taught that your final certainty is from this illumination of the Holy Spirit. This is how you know that you know that you know. That God zaps you, okay? And uh, that's not the Catholic view. Now, God does draw us. The Holy Spirit does draw us. But, but faith... Is a, has an intellectual component and has a volitional component. At the end of the day, as a Catholic, my belief is an act of my will to say, I will align my life with what the Catholic Church teaches. And I don't have to necessarily feel fireworks, although, you know, they come, mm -hmm. all right? And Thomas laid out a path for me where I realized I can, I can do this. I can choose to do this. I don't have to wait around anymore for God to push me in. And, you know, there were some answers to prayer. I remember my first, uh, my first experience actually praying to a saint. Um, I, was, I was terrified of praying to saints. But I prayed to St. <laughs> Therese of Lisieux. Uh, if this Catholic stuff is really true, you've got to show me. And about a day later, she sent me two Catholics to my work who happened to uh, attend St. Therese of Lisieux Parish. And they came to me and talked to me about the Catholic faith. I thought, this has <laughs> got to be an answer to prayer. And um, so eventually in 2003, I was received into full communion in the Catholic Church. My son was baptized in the Catholic Church on the same day. And uh, my wife also came in. And now she, she is as fulfilled and happy in the church as I am. Let's... Uh Let's assume watching our program, there's a, a real conservative evangelical Presbyterian of your ilk who right. happens to be watching. I'm wondering, uh, would you have a word you might want to say to them why they should consider making the same journey home that you and your wife have made? How do you know that the Bible is the sole rule of faith? Who told you? Hmm. Not Jesus. Luther and Calvin told you. Men. Did they tell you with divine authority? No, they didn't. They told you because they wanted an excuse to leave the Catholic Church. And then go back and look at Paul again. What does he say about the ethical life, the moral life? Uh, justification by faith. Is it scriptural? It isn't. Yeah. And from the inside, the Catholic Church is a wonderful place. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Your journey. I, I really it. do appreciate the way you've expressed it uh, so clearly. and. Uh, you know, often on the program we'll have guests that come from different traditions, but your particular unique evangelical Presbyterian back background I think speaks to a lot.
that are out there today that are struggling with the meaning of their evangelical faith. Because that's one thing the internet has helped us see, is right. all the other opinions that are out there. That's right. Uh, uh, and so thank you so much for your witness to thank us. Thank you. And singing in the choir, you did. You did Appreciate you that. Thank, thank you for you. doing that. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. David has hit a very uh, large number of nails on the head, of very important issues, and I pray that it's been an encouragement to your own journey of faith. God bless you. See you next week.